the hope I'm going to talk about this afternoon is imagination, the frontiers of imagination, and paradoxically, how the largest factories of the world create the, the, the greatest opportunity for imagination I think the world has ever seen. And Taiwan's particularly powerful place in that. So bear with me, we think of the largest factories that have been ever created in the world as places human ant farms where low-wage workers work on kind of uncreative things. But, but go with me on this story, please. John Watlington gave, gave a great overview of One Laptop Per Child. I was also deeply inspired um, and joined with Nicholas Negroponte. But if we rewind to about 15 years ago, Nicholas Negroponte, a professor at MIT, a well-known technology visionary, decided to build some schools in Cambodia. No running water, no electricity, no roads. But being an MIT professor, he found a way to give those kids laptops. And the impact was transformational on their education. And he thought, wow, if you can only make a $100 laptop, you could scale this worldwide. So um, uh, around that time, I was really sick. I was living in a wheelchair. I was sleeping 20 hours a day. I was about to drop out of school. Um, and live with my parents and spend my left, the rest of my life probably doing that. And then they found the brain tumor and sucked it out of my nose, and I was better. But every day since then, for 15 years, I have to take pills every day to live to replace the chemicals that that part of my brain would make. I found out I was still smart. I finished my PhD four months later, started my first company with a gazillion dollars some, somebody gave me, and that was somewhat successful. But at any rate, I challenged myself. I was still smart, but every day, and I wish all of us maybe had the opportunity, every day, if I don't take those pills, I die. So I'm forced to think, what do I want to do as long as I'm alive? Because every day I have to face that question. So how do you make your life count? And so I paradoxically somehow ended up in Nicholas Negroponte's office as he was trying to start the $100 Laptop Corporation, as it was called then, and instantly joined him. And on that evening, rather than flying back to California, where I lived at the time, I flew to Europe and the next three years are a bit of a blur, but it worked, and, and John Watlington gave you a great overview of that. Here's some kids in, in Africa, and uh, one laptop per child donate a lot, donated a lot of laptops to Sichuan province after the devastating earthquake there a couple years ago. So it was, it's been a huge success. It ushered in, catalyzed the netbook revolution, which is the fastest growing product category on record. 100 million units have shipped in the last three years. But what I want to talk to today is, how do you do that? There's the technology problems, and that's one thing. But how do you convince people to join with you to make a $100 laptop? Because when we started on this, it was, well, uh, two MIT professors, people kind of over here in Asia, kind of thought it was a joke. <laughs> but you know, you'd, I, would, I did. I met with the chairman of Samsung, just me, um, flanked by four vice presidents on one side and another four vice presidents on another side. And I was actually, I realized, the humor portion of their day. They, they actually <laughs> have kind of hard jobs and kind of, you know, it's, it's really tough. Keep the factories full, get the yield up, get the cost down, fix the factories when they're broke, and fix all the problems. And then they took a meeting on the $100 laptop, and that was, that was fun for them. And they explained to me all the reasons it wouldn't work. And there are a lot. And um, I could address some of those and not others. And so I, I, I took them down. And I thought, you know, great. When I can answer these questions, can I come back to you and, and maybe you can give me the next five. Unwittingly, um, many, uh, many vice presidents, some in this room of some of the largest corporations in the world, helped debug the $100 laptop while it was cheap to do that, while it was on paper. And so, 
You know, the thing is, when people are saying no, find out why. Because they can give you a great deal of advice to make the plan better. So we did. We got, we got the plan uh, a lot better. And at a moment of weakness for, for Barry Lamb, I think, right after uh, Kofi Annan unveiled my hand-soldered prototype at, at, the World Econo uh, at, at the UN Summit on the Digital Divide in, Afri in Tunisia, actually, um, uh, almost every head of state in the world wanted in into the project. And that was enough, that kind of publicity was enough, where Barry Lamb said, OK, the founder, founder and at that time CEO of Guanda, Quanta Computer, he said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll take it on, and, and Quanta Display will make the display. And all of a sudden, it was no longer just two professors at MIT. We had the largest ODM in the world saying, I'm going to do it. And that made it real. And so I moved to Taiwan <laughs> because that's what you do. So that was key. So I think in, the ter in terms of innovation, as John Watlington explained, there's a ton of innovation in the $100 laptop. And most people think of innovation as, you know, the way a BMW uh, comes out, very small volume, very expensive and the features and technology in it trickle down over the course of years to the rest of us that I don't drive BMW, uh, the rest of us that, that drive cars. And instead, I think what we can do, what we must do, is innovate at the bottom of the pyramid. Because if you can pull it off, and it's difficult, if you can pull it off, you can extend the base and the height of that pyramid instantly. And that's extremely valuable. And it's extremely valuable at this moment because of the growth of consumer electronics and IT electronics transforming our opportunities, particularly in the developing world. Some of the speakers today have talked about the impact of, of cell phones and laptops and so forth for opportunities for education, for business, and so forth. We're right now dealing with a deploy base of 2 billion computers and 5 billion cell phones. Just for an idea of scale, 10 years ago, about 10 million laptops shipped a year. Only 10 million, and we've grown, and it continues. 10 years from now, we'll have a deploy base of about 50 billion devices. That's because each of us has a cell phone, a laptop, a tablet, a personal health system, a big TV, a little TV, each one of us, not just the rich people in the developed world, but also in the developing world. We are going to bring devices to the world's people. There's about six and a half billion people in the world. And to do that, you have to leverage the manufacturing factories of the world in, 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 uh, I believe, in a more innovative way because the needs, again, as, as John Watlington from OLPC spoke about, the needs of the developing world are quite different. There isn't power, a power outlet in the wall. Sometimes these people have, you know, one room homes. They're outside a lot of the time. The, the demands are quite different on the devices. And in fact, those demands, low power, robustness, use, use in any environment, um, not breaking, and so forth, are the very demands that are needed to make the devices eco-friendly in any, any environment. And you know, I've asked this A-B question many, to many, many people over the last six years, and I've only ever heard one answer. Just, just even if you're rich and don't care about the environment, answer this question. Do you want your batteries to last longer? or not so long? There's only one answer to that question, longer. So even if you don't care about the rest of it, you care about that. So every display in the world is made in Asia. About half of them, 40% really, are made in Taiwan. About 40% of them are made in Korea. 10% still in Japan, and about 10% in mainland China. So if you, if you really want to make a device, the display actually leads it. It, 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 enables, it, enables, it enabled the laptop to exist. It's the most expensive, it's the most power-hungry component in a device. In addition, most of the manufacturing of devices in the world right now is in mainland China. 
but there's one city in the world that has a profound impact on the design of those devices. And it is not Cupertino, California, where a company called Apple is located. 90% of the world's devices, from cell phones to tablets to laptops, are designed in this city, in Taipei, by companies like BenQ, like Quanta, like Acer, like Asus, like Dell, like HP, like Toshiba. They're here. They're doing their design here. So if you want to innovate in devices in a way that allows the world to cross the digital divide, I mean, we're not living in the Iron Age or the Stone Age. We're living in the digital age. The world's information is digital. If we want to work with it, there's one city in the world to be, and it's here. So I, I spend most of my time here, 70%. I still travel a lot, but uh, and uh, have a company here, dual headquarters, San Francisco and Taipei, trying to figure out how we can most effectively catalyze and innovate great technology that can scale very rapidly to, to scale. I think <sighs> I mentioned that I view, my view is that the display really is the bottleneck on this because it is very expensive and it's very power hungry. And it's how we get most of our information from a device. It's, it's what we look at. If you look at a tablet, if you look at a cell phone, what you see is the screen and not much else. The styling of the plastic housing on the back. But for, I've spent most of my life designing, before I got into low-cost electronics, designing very expensive, very high-end displays. And I've used versions of this slide every year for the past decade. And all of these technologies here, the rollable paper, the projected 3D display, the they're, they're, uh, trans transparent displays and so forth, they're perpetually, if you read the media, one year away. You use the slide every year for 10 years and it's still perpetually a year away. And the problem, the problem is manufacturing this at scale. And so if you want to solve this problem, you probably have to look at what can we manufacture well? Well, this is the past five years and projected the next five years of display manufacturing worldwide. The stuff in blue on this bar graph, you don't really have to read all of it, sorry it's so small. Just look at the stuff in blue, that's the bulk of it. That's LCD, liquid crystal displays. That's what you've got to use if you want to figure out how to crack this problem. So how can we get innovation in LCDs? It's been a huge accomplishment to get to direct view, large area, HDTV in the wall. But that's not really the best for reading. It's not very portable. Sure, there's small displays going into different things, but they're power hungry. You know, how do we take the LCD industry and convince them to innovate more quickly? Well, they are very innovative. Look what they did. And, you know, about four, five companies in the world really control 80, 90 percent of LCD production. And to my knowledge, they've never taken an external design. Before I was able to convince them at One Laptop for Child to take my design, because Nicholas convinced almost every head of state on the planet that they wanted millions of laptops en masse into their country. The barrier was high. But. It's tough to be in charge of an LCD fab or company because it's, I, in my opinion, it's one of the largest nonprofits in the world. It's a $120 billion nonprofit making commodity electronics that they have to sell to just kind of break even. And so what we're trying to do is why don't we sell this stuff for more, stop competing, making the same thing and competing in cost, and let's make some innovative screens. So. That's what we're trying to do. One of the first ways to do that is to focus on power. Here you see a picture of a power parade for an Android phone. Phones used to last a week and then a couple days. And now that we have smartphones, we, sometimes they don't even last a full day. And if you look at why, it's because the screen's taking a whole bunch of power. In tablets, let's take an iPad, for example, a popular tablet. The screen takes 70, 80% of the power. So you really want to bring that power down, and, and we're, we're doing that. 
I believe that that slide I showed with all of those technologies that we hope for next year in LCD, can, in, in other technologies, can be done in the existing LCD factories of the world. We should be able to get 100 times lower power with those LCDs by just doing innovative design using the manufacturing processes that exist. Just like 25 years ago, design of silicon was separated from manufacturing of silicon. TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corp, started, and now all of a sudden, innovative designers, they, it's how old it is, taped out. They used magnetic tape with the information for the chip on it to the fab, and back came chips. And the silicon revolution was really, you know, stoked through that and, and exploded. But screen should be as comfortable to read as paper, um, sunlight readable, super slim, you know, they, there should be both input and output, touch, eye tracking, all kinds of things. We get, since the world's information is digital, we should have screens on more surfaces, right? It, it, it just makes sense. And how do we do that? A, a cell phone can pipe the information that we need. And I guess to just underline why this is so important, in people with normal vision, 70% of your mind is dedicated to processing visual and graphical information. It's how we're wired. And increasingly, the screen itself actually is the device. So that's why I'm so passionate about it. Here's some of the results. Again, John Watlington talked about this. Here's a screen that I designed for one laptop per child. And it went from kickoff to mass production ready in six months, shipped two and a half million of them. Yields really high. Reliability is extraordinary. As John discussed, sunlight readable, high resolution. It has an e-paper mode, color, video, all of this in the lowest cost laptop ever made. And it enabled a profoundly lower power consumption than has been achieved even yet in any kind of netbook other than this. It's a one watt uh, laptop. In the, in the greenest laptop made, and that's not just the color. On Pixel Cheap, um, we're pushing that further. I spun out of one laptop per child in response to the netbook revolution. They copied the form factor, but I wish that some of the technology was copied. So I created Pixel T to try to work with the industry here in Taiwan and the world to try to get innovative screen technology into a variety of devices. So we're shipping, we've been shipping for some time in netbooks and now in tablets and going large size and small size in cell phones. And this is just the start. I, I do believe that we can create some of the things I spoke of before. So in summary, I have you know, a little demo here and I can show more later of, of what the screen actually looks like. This wakes up, yeah. So that's uh, with the backlight on. It just looks like a normal screen. Now, one of the really cool things about this is you can turn off the backlight. Right now, that's 10x lower power consumption than an iPad screen, sunlight readable with video and quite, quite readable for text. So the stuff works, and it leverages existing mass production facilities. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thank you.